dia, pessoal. Bom dia a todos. É um prazer enorme estarmos aqui hoje, de manhãzinha cedo para a gente, mas de noite para o nosso palestrante convidado, que vem da Austrália, uh, um pesquisador bastante renomado na área e o que eu agradeço enormemente. Hoje eu vou dividir a, a, aqui a, a sala com a Ana, né, que é uma estudante nossa de doutorado, então muito bom estar dividindo a sala com ela também, né? E eu queria dizer a todos, então, que as perguntas podem ser feitas pelo YouTube, né? E nós transmitiremos para o nosso convidado em seguida. E é, eu vou passar a palavra para a Ana, que vai apresentar, mas antes de passar a palavra, que eu gostaria de lembrar, como sempre, por favor, deixe o seu like, o seu joinha, né? É, se possível, subscreva o canal se ainda não o fez, tá bom? Ajude-nos a, ajude a subsistir no YouTube. Então, sou Ana, you can introduce Dr. King. Please. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, morning, guys. I'm more than glad to introduce you Professor Glenn King for the University of Queensland in Australia. He's a toxinologist work with animal venoms and working in really hard in cure some disease and working. Uh, so this main point of his research right now is the cure of the stroke in spider venus which one he's going to talk about for us today and he's really renowned in the area has published more than 250 papers up to now so i'm more than glad to have you here glenn today please be welcome thank you very much anna for your introduction bom dia everyone it's lovely to be here i think this is a these seminars are a wonderful idea and i'm really happy to be uh, involved. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Can everybody see that? Yep. Fantastic. Um, and can everybody hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Fantastic. As um, Anna said, the uh, the work in my lab involves trying to develop drugs to treat what i would call pervasive nervous system disorders and the, the ones that we're most interested in are chronic pain epilepsy and stroke and we're interested in ion channels that might be the cause of the disease or play a really important part of that disease and so we're basically trying to develop ion channel drugs and they actually are the the third largest class of human drugs now after uh, G protein coupled receptor drugs um, and kinase drugs. And what we do, which is perhaps a little unusual, is we use venoms as a source of those drugs. And the, and the reason for that is that invertebrate venomous animals, such as the animals I've shown here, target the nervous system of their prey. And what they generally target are, in fact, ion channels. So the venoms of all of these animals are really combinatorial libraries of ion channel. Uh, compounds. That's not true of snakes, for example, which are mostly hematoxic. So we tend not to have snake venoms in our collection because they don't have the sort of compounds we're interested in. So we have the largest collection of arthropod venoms in the world. We have venoms from over 300 species. And the work I want to tell you about today is relates to a spider venom peptide that we think may be helpful in terms of the treatment of stroke. So just a little bit of background about stroke and why it's such a serious clinical problem. So stroke is the second leading cause of death worldwide. It's the second leading cause of death in Brazil as well. It's the third leading cause of death in Australia. It's also the leading cause of serious long-term disability. So one year after a stroke, about 50% of all survivors still require daily care. And because of that, stroke um, accounts for about 3% of global healthcare expenditure. So 3% of all healthcare expenditure around the world is actually spent on stroke. And the reason it's such a serious problem is we have very little therapeutic options in terms of treating stroke. So most of you probably know there are two types of stroke. There's a so-called hemorrhagic stroke, which is a, when there's a bleed in the brain, so when a blood vessel bursts. And for a hemorrhagic stroke, there's actually no therapies available whatsoever. There's, there's nothing we can do. 
uh, except let it run its course and, and uh, see what sort of brain damage you end up with. The more common type of stroke is an ischemic stroke. Uh, that's where there's a block in a cerebral arteries, which uh, cuts off oxygen supply to the brain. Now for ischemic stroke, there is one drug that could potentially be used. It's known as tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. It's a clot busting drug. It's not used very often for two reasons. One, it has to be used within about four and a half hours of the onset of stroke. But the other reason is because of its mechanism of action, it could potentially introduce, induce an intracranial hemorrhage in an ischemic stroke patient. In other words, turn the ischemic stroke into the much more damaging hemorrhagic stroke. And because of that, neurologists are scared to use the drug. And for that reason, only about 5% of stroke patients actually receive this drug. And what that means is the vast majority of stroke patients, over 95%, receive no therapy at all. No pharmaceutical options are available. And that's why most stroke patients that have a serious stroke end up with, with very serious brain damage. So just to give you an idea of, of, of what we're trying to do in terms of developing a treatment, when you have a clot in a cerebral artery, the um, region of the stroke, let me just get a pointer here. Oops. The region of the stroke um, sorry, the region of the brain in the, in the most affected area um, where the, you see the, there's the clot in the cerebral artery, the so-called ischemic core, is the neurons are thought to die very quickly. So it's thought that that part of the brain is actually unrecoverable therapeutically. But there's a spreading wave of destruction that spreads out for that ischemic core, and, and that evolves over a much slower period of time, over hours to days, and that's called the perinfarct zone or the ischemic penumbra. And because that zone develops slowly, it's thought that if you had a neuroprotective drug, you might potentially be able to stop a lot of that damage. And so that's what we're trying to achieve here is a drug that will prevent this spreading wave of destruction in the brain and just limit the amount of brain tissue that's lost as a result of the stroke. Now, we had been working on a really interesting class of ion channels called acid sensing ion channels, which as their name suggests, respond to acid. And the particular one we'd been interested in was ASIC 1A, which is one of the subtypes, which I'll, I'll talk about later. We were interested about that ion channel in the context of chronic pain, another one of our major interests. But then I came across this extraordinary paper, which dates back way back to 2004, and what they showed is if you just knocked it, genetically knocked out that channel, ASIC 1A, and gave mice a stroke, you could reduce. So this is the infarct size um, in a mouse that's been given, a, 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 given an ischemic stroke. And this is the massive reduction you see from here to here in the knockout mouse. So just knocking out that channel in the mouse reduces the stroke, the size of the damage in the brain, by 60%, and yet these mice are otherwise phenotypically normal. And that suggests that this channel played and a really important role in stroke and might be a really good target for a neuroprotective drug. And that's what we set out to try and achieve is to develop a drug that could target that iron channel potently and selectively. So what are these channels? They're, they're really unusual channels. As I said, they're proton gated channels. So in other words, the ligand for this channel is a proton, a hydrogen ion. So it's quite extraordinary um, that the ligand is so small. Um, it, they're expressed in both the peripheral and central nervous system. And they're members of a much larger ion channel family known as the degenerin epithelial sodium channel family. But these ones are only found in chordate, so they're not ubiquitously found. Um, there are four genes, two of them are alternatively spliced, the ASIC-1 and ASIC-2 genes. So you end up with six subtypes. And the functional channels are homo or heterotrimers as shown in this crystal stru structure here. So this is the crystal structure of, of um, chicken, ASIC-1A, and the three subunits are shown in different colors here. 
what you can see is that the channel has six transmembrane helices, but the bulk of the channel is this very large extracellular domain, which as I said, is devoted to sensing protons. And if you look at a surface rendering of the channel, um, and so what are, what's been mapped onto the surface is the electrostatic potential, you can see there's a deep acidic pocket just here, this highly red region. And this is the region that's thought to be responsible for recognizing protons. And when protons are recognized there, there's a conformational change that leads to opening of the channel and an influx of sodium ions and to a lesser extent, calcium ions for this channel. And the kinetics of the channel, the pharmacology is determined by the combination of subunits that make up the trimeric channel. These channels have been known to play a role in pain for a long period of time. For example, ASIC-3 subtype is found in the sensory affer afferent that innervate the heart, and it's well known to play an important role in ischemia-induced cardiac pain. And ASIC-1A, the channel that I'm going to talk about today, was initially thought to play a role in sensing pain, and it now seems pretty clear that it doesn't, but the splice subtype ASIC-1B which is only found in pain sensing neurons, does play a role in sensing pain. So what's the link between this channel and the loss of neurons after a stroke? So when you have an ischemic stroke, there's a block in a cerebral artery that decreases the supply of oxygen to the brain. So the brain now has to change the way um, it utilizes its major fuel. So the major fuel of the brain is actually glucose. The brain is the primary user of glucose in the body. Neurons are particularly energy um, um, intensive um, cells. And they usually burn that glucose oxidatively to create large amounts of ATP. They can no longer do that um, in, in, um, once the oxygen supply to the brain has ceased. So they have to revert to glycolysis. And as you all probably know, the end result of glycolysis is lactate. So you get an accumulation of lactate in the brain. So this is similar to what happens when you're exercising very hard, you can't get oxygen to your muscles fast enough. There's a buildup of lactic acid in your muscle and that gives you that, that pain that you get after intense exercise. Of course, your muscle can clear that lactate, but the brain can't, it has no blood supply in the affected region now. So there's a buildup of lactic acid and the brain pH decreases and it can get very low. So in a very severe stroke, the pH in the ischemic core can get as low as pH six. And that's enough to really robustly activate this channel. So you get acidosis of the brain and that activates this channel. This, this channel is about half activated at pH 6.7. So it gets very robustly activated. Now this channel is found on the dendrites really should be drawn over here, postsynaptically on neurons. And it turns out that when that channel is activated, it actually engages the necroptosis pathways. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a programmed cell death pathway. So it activates um, one of the major mediators of that pathway called RIP1 kinase. And that basically just sends a signal to the neurons to die. And so our simple idea was if we could find a really good inhibitor of this channel, maybe we could prevent that necroptosis and we could prevent the downstream brain injury. Now, what we would normally do, as I told you, is we take our venom collection, we would screen all of those venoms against our iron channel of interest, in this case, ASIC-1A, and look for venoms that might have compounds that would potently inhibit that channel. In this case, we got really, really lucky. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I want to tell you about this story um, because serendipity often plays a really important role in science. There was a student in the laboratory at the time from Guatemala, Sandy Pinata Gonzalez, who was studying the venom of the Australian funded web spider for a completely different reason. Uh, our interest in that spider was that it seems to have the most complex chemical arsenal in the natural world. Its venom contains over 3000 compounds. And what Sandy was trying to understand is how did it evolve such complex, such a complex venom. And in the course of doing that work, she discovered a really interesting peptide. And while she wasn't working on stroke herself, she was aware of what was going on around her in the lab. And she came to me and she said, I found a sequence of a peptide 
that looks similar to a peptide that you're already working on in the context of stroke. And indeed that was right. And you can see the sequence is shown at the bottom here. It's actually two repeated domains. So this first domain is actually quite similar to the second domain. So we thought that was very interesting and that we should take this peptide and see whether it was an inhibitor of that channel. But then we had a significant problem in that this is a large peptide, probably beyond the realms of easy peptide chemical synthesis. And so we would have to make it recombinantly. But the problem was it had six disulfide bonds. Um, and in other words, 12 cysteines that are paired up to form six disulfide bonds. If you do the mathematics, it turns out that those cysteines could be paired up in 10,395 different ways. In other words, there's 10,395 possible isomers of that peptide. And only one of them will be the native isomer. And that's the one that is presumably going to have the native activity. So it required a brave student to take this on. And fortunately, we did have a fantastic student at the time. Um, a, this was a Ren Chazignon, a French student, was doing her honours. So this is the, the one year of uh, research project you do prior to beginning your PhD in Australia. It's called an honours year. And Ren decided she would like to give this a go. And she decided to express this in a, in a particular bacterial expression system. It's an Escherichia coli expression system that we commonly use. And she was able to make the peptide. And remarkably, at the end of the process, the purification, there was only a single isomer, which is the native isomer and is functional. And she was also able to produce labeled peptide, uh, sorry, uh, isotopically labeled peptide for NMR studies. And what I'm showing you here is the NMR structure. So you can see, um, this is the ensemble. This is a schematic over here. As I said, it contains two domains, an N-terminal domain, a C-terminal domain um, that look much like one another. And they're joined by this short link here, which I've shown in orange. And each of these domains have three disulfide bonds. And these disulfide bonds form a very special motif that we like to see in peptides that we might be thinking of using therapeutically. <clears throat> and, and that motif is known as an inhibitor cysteine knot or simply a knotten motif, so a knotten domain. So the way that, that is configured is if you take this bottom disulfide here in red and this top one here and the intervening sections of the polypeptide backbone, they form a loop, a closed loop. And this central disulfide here, which I've drawn here in orange, I don't know if you can tell from this static figure here, it actually dives through the center of that loop, it bisects that loop. You can see it better if I show the video. So that middle disulfide is, bis is bisecting the loop formed by the other two disulfides in the peptide backbone. And what this does is effectively tie the peptide in a knot. And what that does in turn is give these peptides extraordinary stability. So very often you can boil these peptides cool them back down and they retain their activity. They're uh, very resistant to extremes of pH or at least acidic pH. Uh, they're very resistant to all sorts of organic solvents. But most importantly, they're very resistant to proteases. So they tend to have very good stability in human plasma, for example, which obviously for a therapeutic peptide is ideal. So if you take this, these peptides and put them in human serum ex vivo, they have half-lives of hours to many days. So how do we test the activity of this toxin or this peptide? So we have to look at its ability to inhibit the activity of this ASIC1A channel. The way we look at the activity of ASIC1A is we take eggs from the African clawed frog called Xenophus labus. So we harvest these eggs and then we inject them with messenger RNA that encodes the channel we're interested in, in this case, ASIC1A. Why do we use these frog eggs? because they're electrically silent. They don't express uh, hardly any ion channels in their membrane. So if we express our channel of interest, it's really the only channel there and we can look at it in isolation. We wait a couple of days for the channel to be expressed and then we, we can and come in with some electrodes. Um, we can clamp the, the voltage and we can, we can measure uh, currents through the, the um, channel. So what we do in the case of um, the ASIC channels, we have those oocytes sitting at physiological pH and then we rapidly drop the pH to six. Remember, this is an acid-sensitive channel. That turns the channel on, 
And this deflection here is an inward sodium current. So we're measuring the influx of sodium. So when we do that and we add very tiny amounts of this spider venom peptide, this is 0.1 nanomolar here, you can see we get pretty good inhibition. And when we do what's for, called a full concentration response curve, what we find is the IC50, the concentration required to inhibit 50% of the current, is around 500 picomolar. So it's less than one nanomolar IC50. So this is extraordinarily potent for a peptide that, that uh, is straight out of the box. To give you some context, there's only one small molecule that's known to inhibit these channels fairly well. It's called amelioride. It's an antidiuretic drug. This peptide is 20,000 fold more potent than that small molecule drug. So it's an extraordinarily potent inhibitor of the channel. How does it work? What does it actually do to inhibit the channel? These channels are quite unusual in that they, once they're activated by protons, they go from a resting state to an open state. Then they go to, into this desensitized state, which, which uh, is inactive, can't carry current, and takes a long time to recover from that desensitized state back to the resting state before they can be activated again. So to find out how this peptide worked, we teamed up with Angelo Karamaitis in Joe Lynch's lab here at the University of Queensland, where they did what's called single channel electrophysiology, where you're only looking at currents from a single channel at a time. And you can see in the absence of the peptide, um, as soon as we drop the pH to, from 7.4 to 6, the channel turns on. So these little deflections here indicate the current's turning on. So this is off and this is on. It's binary, right? Because there's only a single channel here. So it's just on or off. On, sorry, off is this line here, on is here. It turns on straight away and stays on for a long time. In the presence of the peptide though, you can see it's very reluctant to turn on. You can see here, it's, it's flat lined, it's off. It turns on sporadically, but then goes back off again. And this is, this is quantified over here. So basically what this peptide does is, is block activation of the channel. So even in the presence of, of uh, a very acidic pH, um, this peptide prevents the channel turning on. It's very selective. I'm not gonna go through this data. It's, it's very selective for the ASIC 1A subtype over the other ASIC subtypes. This is more important from a therapeutic perspective. Once we've bound the peptide to the channel on those eel sites that I told you about, we can then perfuse the eel sites to try and wash the peptide off. Now, PCTX1 is another related peptide that's been well studied, that's also a good inhibitor of this channel. When you try and wash PCTX1 off, it comes off relatively quickly. So after about 20 minutes of washing, you recover, completely recover the currents. But when you try and wash HO1A, of this new peptide, you can see it recovers very slowly. In other words, it binds very, very tightly to the channel and is hard to wash off. <coughs> Excuse me. And from a therapeutic perspective, obviously that's a really good thing. You want the peptide to be bind and inhibit the channel for a significant period of time. So the question is, does it do anything in terms of uh, preventing uh, brain damage after stroke? Remember, our hypothesis is that if we can selectively and potently inhibit this channel, then we can stop the brain damage that happens after an ischemic stroke. So the model we use of stroke is a, is a nice one. The, the most models of stroke are, are, this, uh, are called a filament model. And what you do is you do surgery on the mouse. You have to thread a filament through the external carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, and, and lead it up to the point where it's now blocking the middle cerebral artery and that, that blocks oxygen supply to that part of the brain. The problem with this is it quite requires surgery. The stroke happens while the animal is under anesthesia and that confounds the outcome of the experiment. The animals always recover better if the stroke happens while they're under anesthesia. And of course, that's not the way a stroke happens in a human normally. We're usually awake and conscious. So what we do is take these spontaneously hypertensive rats and we cannulate them a week before the experiment and let them recover. So they're cannulated in such a way that when we're ready to induce a stroke, we just infuse a small amount of this vasoconstrictor peptide called endothelin-1 
into the vicinity of the middle cerebral artery, that's enough to severely constrict that artery and cause a stroke. So the stroke happens while the animals are conscious, just as that would in a human. And this is work we did with Claudia McCarthy, who's in Rob Widdop's lab at Monash University down in Melbourne, Australia. So in these proof of principle experiments, what we did is we delivered a single dose of this peptide at very low dose. So this is not a misprint. This is not two milligrams per kilogram or two micrograms per kilogram. It truly is two nanograms per kilogram. So very tiny dose. And we administered it two, four, or eight hours after we induced the stroke. And those numbers are really important. The problem with a lot of experiments in this area, and I think the reason why a lot of drugs have failed is if you go back and look at the preclinical clinical experiments, the drug was delivered immediately after the stroke or often one hour after the stroke. The problem is more than 60% of human patients take at least two hours to get to the hospital after the stroke begins. So you must be able to, your drug must be able to treat that population. That's, that's the bulk of the population that you're gonna to wanna to treat. So we started at two hours. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split the infarct size into the peri-infarct zone, which is the region we thought might be recoverable and the ischemic core, which remember the dogma is that's not recoverable. And you can see in the ischemic, in the peri-infarct zone, which is the, the so-called cortical region, we've seen 80% reduction in the size of the infarct in the presence of this drug. So we then went to delivering the drug four hours after stroke, and we're still seeing a massive de decrease in the infarct size. We then went to eight hours, um, which would capture a very large percentage of the stroke population, because this would correspond to a longer time period in the human. We're still seeing a two thirds reduction in the size of the brain damage which is pretty extraordinary. So we then decided to, to look at the ischemic core and remarkably, at least at two and four hours, there's a significant reduction in the size of the damage in the ischemic core region in the so-called striatal region. And um, at four hours, even with the small number of mice in this experiment, that was statistically significant reduction. So we think the ischemic core is actually recoverable to some extent at least at early time points if you have a good neuroprotective drug. And this, this, this is a coronal slice of a, of a mouse brain from these experiments, just, just to show you the difference in damage. So these are, these are mice that got the drug eight hours after the stroke began. So these animals got the vehicle, which is just saline. You can see this dark area is the damaged area of the brain. And you can see how much reduced that is in the animals that got this drug. It's greatly reduced. This is just looking at um, the number of neurons in the brain using a, 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 what's called new end staining. Um, and what we're looking at is, is the contralateral side. So that's the hemisphere that didn't get the stroke and the ipsilateral side. So that's the side of the brain that did get the stroke. You can see the animals treated with the vehicle, two, four and eight hours have lost almost all of their neurons in that region. Um, and, and this is the cortical region. Um, Whereas the ones that got the drug, you see a significantly larger number of neurons surviving. Not as good as the contralateral region, so you never fully recover um, all of the neurons, um, but a substantial number, and it's similar in the striata region. And of course, it's fine to show that you've reduced the size of the visible infarct in the brain, but the important thing is to show that that actually correlates to an improvement in the, in the outcomes for, in this case, the mice or in, in, in a, you know, humans, a, a better behavioral outcome. That's an after all, what, what you're aiming for is better quality of life as the survivors. So we looked at the, both the neurological performance and the, and, the, um, and the motor performance of these mice. So neurological performance is, is just where you look at a number of tasks and, and sum those up to give a score that ranges from zero to six, where six is really impaired animals, nought is a perfectly normal animal. So if you look at these animals that received vehicle or peptide drug four hours after stroke, prior to stroke, that's PS here, these are normal mice. After the stroke, the vehicle treated animals are really heavily impaired. But you can see the animals that got the drug 
the neurological performance is almost back to baseline. And it's a similar story with motor performance where we put them on a ledge beam and we let them walk along the beam to their nesting area. And any of you that have done animal rodent experiments will know that mice are good climbers and they're very good at balancing. So you can see prior to the stroke, they never fall off. These animals that receive vehicle four hours after the stroke are falling off almost every single time. They're highly impaired. But again, the animals that receive the peptide drug, their motor performance is almost, almost back to normal. So we think this is a potentially um, very exciting breakthrough. And why we think it might be so profound is because of the type of drug it is. At the moment, the, the problem with treating a human stroke patient is you can't do anything until you get them to the hospital. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned very early, is if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, you can't give them that TPA drug because it would make things worse. And what that means is you have to know what type of stroke it is before you can begin treatment. So you have to get the patient to hospital, you have to image their brain, and then you, the neurologist will decide the course of treatment. This is a different type of drug. There's no risk of inducing bleeding here. And what that means is this potentially could be delivered by first responders. Why is that important? Well, after the stroke begins, you lose 2 million neurons per minute. And if you have to wait two hours to get to the hospital, you're gonna lose a lot of neurons. And so the earlier you can get a drug to a stroke patient, a neuroprotective drug, the more of the brain you will save. The other thing that's important is we've shown that we can go, we can get neuroprotection even eight hours after stroke, which would, as I said, correspond to a longer time period in, in a human. So we think this means just we could treat a larger cohort of patients that could then currently can be treated with, with current techniques. And of course, the drug would be compatible with current reperfusion strategies. And so the best strategy um, after stroke is if you get there in the first few hours is what's called mechanical thrombectomy where they try and mechanically remove the clot. And uh, this would be perfectly compatible with that. You could deliver drug at the same time. Because this drug course had such a profound effect in, in, in um, minimizing the brain damage after what is an ischemic injury. So lack of oxygen to the brain. We wondered whether this ion channel might be important for ischemic injury of other organs. And if you look at how long you can preserve other organs for transplant, so you've taken them out of the donor and they're now highly ischemic. The one that is, is, is most susceptible to ischemic injury is the heart. So typically you can only keep a human heart after you've taken it out of the donor for about four hours um, before you transplant it. So we decided to see whether this channel might play a role in the ischemic injury of the heart. Now, about the time I was thinking about this, we had a new group leader arrive here at our institute called Nathan Palpan. And Nathan and I had coffee and I explained the background of this. And I said, what's known about this iron channel in the heart? And he said, well, as far as I know, nobody's even looked to see if it's there. And so that was the first thing we did. We had a look at, there was actually some transcriptome data that, that um, nobody really looked at in any detail. Uh, and it turned out this data uh, looked at um, just general expression of, 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 of um, proteins in, in um, cardiomyocytes, so they're the human muscle cells, um, one day and 56 day after birth and before and after a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And the important thing to note here is the only one of these iron ASIC subtypes that you find in the heart is ASIC 1A. Um, it's not changed greatly um, by a heart attack and it does increase in expression slightly with age. So that was quite interesting. The levels of expression are low. If you look at say in comparison to heart muscle proteins like troponin, uh, then it's a very low level of expression, but nonetheless, it is expressed. So we then decided to um, have a look at where it, whether it might be important in the context of cardiac ischemia. And for that, we use this model of cardiac ischemia reperfusion injury known as the Langendorf model. So this is, a, this is a quite a nice model where you can take a heart out of a rodent and hang it in this perfusion rig and you perfuse it retrogradely by the aorta. And you can keep this heart going for up to a few hours 
And this, what you see here is a rat heart on one of these Langendorf rigs, beating it at its normal rate of a couple of hundred beats per minute. Now, because you're perfusing that heart, you have control over that. You can turn that off at any stage and give that heart global ischemia. And so that's what we did here is we, we had these hearts on the rig, had them beating, and then we gave them global ischemia. We turned the perfusion off and we did that for 25 minutes. And what we did is we did it to wild type mice and mice with a specific knockout of the ASIC-1A channel to see whether the ASIC-1A mice might recover better. And you can see, we're looking here what's called left ventricular developed pressure. It goes from 100% baseline down to zero when we turn off the perfusion. When we turn it back on, you see this rapid recovery apparently, and then it bottoms out again. That's the reperfusion injury. So paradoxically, when you reperfuse the heart, you get additional injury from the reperfusion. So it recovers, plummets again, and then you get a slow recovery. And this is the recovery of the wild type mice in the gray. And this is the recovery of the, of the mice with a knockout. And you can see they recover their ventricular pressure a bit better. And that suggested to us that this channel was involved in ischemic injury of the heart. And so we then did the experiment again with the, the um, wild type mice, but this time with and without the peptide drug HI1A. Again, just at 10 nanomolar. And you can see the mice that get the drug at the time of reperfusion um, recover much, much better. So that was, that was exciting. So that suggested that this ASIC-1A is really quite important in ischemic injury of the heart. So we then turn to perhaps the, uh, as I mentioned before, the most serious ischemic injury you could give to a heart, and that is take it out of a donor in preparation for transplant. Um, and so we teamed up with the heart transplant unit at the Victor Chen Cardiac Research Institute in Sydney. This is the one of the best heart transplant teams in the world, uh, led by Peter McDonald. And I said to Peter, so what, what do you do with the human heart when you take it out? What's the standard of care? And he said, well, we just put it in an ice box. I thought he was joking. I said, no, how do you really treat it? He said, no, that's what we do. We put it in buffer and we put it in an ice box. So that there is the standard of treatment for a human heart when it's taken out of the donor. So as you can imagine, it becomes ischemic very, very quickly. Um, and the cardiomyocytes become damaged as a result of that. And so the question is, would this drug protect those cardiomyocytes from that type of ischemic injury? And so what we did is we took mouse hearts. So this was done by Sarah Skewer and, and Peter McDonald. And they took uh, hearts and these are rodent hearts again, stored them for eight hours. So that's much longer than you'd normally be able to um, and have them still viable for transplant. And you can see, if you look at some of the parameters of the heart, so these are put back on one of these Langendorf rigs so we can measure all these parameters. If we look at just the aortic flow and the cardiac output, at the end of eight hours, these hearts that were just in the buffer alone are pretty sick hearts. They're almost dead. You can see they have almost no flow or cardiac output. But these are the, the, the green here are the hearts that received 10 nanomolar of the drug. So the only difference here is we added 10 nanomolar of the peptide drug to that preservation solution, which is called Celsior. And you can see we get remarkable recovery of aortic flow as well as cardiac output. So that was obviously a very promising result. So we then went to an even more severe situation so most hearts are recovered from donors that are so-called brain dead. So the patient is declared brain dead, but the heart is still beating. So the heart is still functional when it's removed from the donor. Now there's a, there's a potentially another way you could um, procure human heart. And that is um, donation after what's called circuitry deaths. So these are instances where there's a tiny amount of brain activity still. So the patient can't be declared brain dead, but it's clear they will never recover. And so the, um, the doctor has a discussion with the family and they may decide that they will turn off life support. Now, in this case, the definition of death is, the, is asystole, 
the absence of ventricular contractions of the heart. So in other words, death is declared when the heart stops beating. Um, and it had always been thought that because those hearts were basically dead at that point, that they could never be used for transplant. But what Peter uh, McDonald, the person I just mentioned, had shown a few years ago is if those hearts were taken and put on one of those Langendorf rigs and quickly perfused, they could be recovered sufficiently to be used for human transplant. Um, and 30% of the transplants in Sydney are now done that way from those sorts of hearts. But let me show you what that heart actually looks like. So this is a, a pig model of a transplant after circuitry death. So this is a, the pig heart here beating. Um, life support is withdrawn. In this case, it's tracheal ligation. Um, and you can see that eventually the heart stops beating virtually. Now, in, in a clinical situation, it, it's actually slightly worse than this because once the, the heart stops beating, most jurisdictions mandate a standoff period of usually two to five minutes to make sure the heart doesn't restart. So your heart is now dead, stopped beating, and you have to wait. And it's warmer that's uh, during this period of time. So this is warm ischemia. So what we're trying to do is take a heart, which is in that position there and not beating and recover it to the point where you can transplant it. So Peter has a model of that. Um, and this is, this is a, um, a rat model of donation after circuitry death. I won't go through all the details, but basically what we're going to do is go through that, that process of circuitry death. We're going to wait the standoff period. We're going to take in a certain amount of time to put it on the instrumentation, which is mimicking what's happening in the human situation. We're gonna put it on one of those Langendorf rigs and we're gonna measure how well it's doing. So this is again, aortic flow and cardiac output. And just to show you again, how bad these hearts are, this is the aortic flow of an untreated heart. So a heart that's um, been procured in this way uh, and, then, and then put on this rig. You can see it's dead. It's, it's not beating at all. There's no flow. Now, this is a complicated figure here. What Peter has done over many years is worked out a number of compounds that can help to preserve that heart, that can help um, minimize the ischemic injury. And those compounds are glycerol trinitrate, erythropoietin, and zoniparide. This one here, zoniparide, is an inhibitor of the sodium um, um, calcium exchanger. Um, it was used clinically, um, um, or went into clinical trials at least for, for cardiac ischemia and, and was actually successful in protecting the heart, but it caused neurological complications, which prevents its use clinically. So while these work very well preclinically, you just can't use this in human patients. So, and, and that's that black line here, you get good recovery with that. If you just use this, this new peptide drug alone, you get pretty much similar recovery. And if you take these two compounds that are allowed to be used clinically and add it together with this new peptide drug, you get very substantial improvement in recovery. So this is now the aortic flow. This is the cardiac output. And this is pretty much like a normal heart. <coughs> so this is like um, you know, a real resurrection, resurrection of a dead heart. So we're pretty excited about that. <clears throat> so the take-home messages are that I think we've shown that this, this unusual ion channel, ASIC1A, is involved in ischemic injuries of the heart and brain. So in the brain, it's involved in, 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 in neuronal damage. In the heart, it's damage to the cardiomyocytes. And I think we've shown that pharmacological inhibition of the channel protects against those ischemic insults of the heart and brain. And because of that, we think this peptide has potential benefit, obviously, in stroke, but also myocardial infarction or heart attack, heart transplant, as I've just described to you. And while we haven't looked at it, it might be particularly interesting to look at in the context of cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest is when the heart stops beating. And so you get neurological manifestations as well because there's no blood supply to the brain. And we've shown that this drug is both neuroprotective and cardioprotective, and that's exactly what you need in the context of a cardiac arrest. So it might be particularly interesting in that regard.
How much time have I got left, Anna? Have I used up all my time? Anna, do I have any time left? Yes, you can, you can, you can do it. Uh, no problem. <laughs> oh, excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic. So just to give you an idea of where we're heading with this, uh, so, so we can perhaps uh, discuss this in question time. We're, we're aiming to look at this in the context of an actual real transplant in a large animal. We're going to use pig and, and, and possibly also sheep. Um, we've just completed work on an in vivo model of myocardial infarction. I was hoping we, I might be able to tell you the results, but um, we haven't completed the analysis and we're completely blinded to the results until all the analyses are done. So I, I can't tell you the results. Um, what I can tell you is, is that the in vivo half-life of this peptide is not as high as we might have expected. So the half-life in mice for IV injection is about 20 to 25 minutes. And that presumably is largely due to renal clearance because as I said, if you take it and put it in human serum ex vivo, it's, it's got a stability of what's well, half-life of several days. So we think it's just um, renal clearance uh, that's causing that relatively small half-life. And the question therefore is in the context of stroke, if you want to deliver the drug intravenously, would small molecule inhibitors be better um, in that they might be able to access the brain more quickly? Because if your peptide only hangs around for 20 minutes, is sufficient amounts going to get into the brain in the context of a stroke to be neuroprotective? And so I just want to show you some interesting work we've done with Hiroaki Suga and Toby Passiora at the University of Tokyo. They have this in develop this incredibly cool method of developing cy small cyclic peptides that will bind to a drug target of interest. And the way it works is you have this library that encodes uh, a random uh, sequences of peptides and many billions of them. You transcribe those to give a messenger RNA library and the messenger RNA is conjugated to puromycin that, that becomes important later. You then translate this. So this is all done in vitro, by the way. This is in vitro transcription translation. So then you do in vitro translation. That gives you the peptide, which you'll see here is still via this puromycin attached to the encoding messenger RNA. You then do reverse transcription. So you now have a peptide sequence attached to its encoding DNA you can then take all those millions and billions of peptide sequences attached to their DNA and see which one of them might bind to an immobilized target. And in this case, we used his six tag asig one a which we'd been making for structural studies. Um, and then you go through that process of several rounds and you enrich for peptides that bind robustly to that target. Um, and you can set it up so those peptides are cyclic. So because you use, um, you're doing this in vitro transcription translation, you can use genetic code reprogramming to basically incorporate any amino acid you want. If you make the first amino acid a chloroacetyl group, and then you have a cysteine anywhere downstream, then spontaneously after translation, they will cyclize to form this stable thiol ether linkage. So you, what you end up with are these um, cyclic peptides that are cyclized via their side chain. The other thing you can do is incorporate in methyl amino acids um, if you want to. And we did try and enrich for those because they're thought to enhance membrane permeability. And remember, we're trying to get these across the blood brain barrier. So I can't give you the sequence of these peptides, but I can tell you that this screen was extraordinarily successful. We've got about 11 peptides ranging in size from only 11 to 15 residues that inhibit the channel with IC50s ranging from 0.75 nanomolar to about 25 nanomolar. And so what we did is we tested them in that Langendorf model of cardiac ischemia reperfusion injury that I told you about. And again, you can see you get good recovery of the ventricular pressure in the presence of relatively small concentrations of these <coughs> cyclic peptides. So we haven't tested these in the context of stroke, but I think they could be very interesting to have a look at in that context. So I'm going to finish up there. Um, I want to 
thank all the people in my lab that were involved in this work and they're the people in blue. Um, there's several key alumni that I mentioned to you that were really important. So Sandy discovered the peptide, Aren was the person who made the peptide, Mehdi was involved in um, the structure, Lachlan got us interested initially in ASIC, these are all alumni, Mehdi and Lachlan now have their own laboratories. I told you about most of these other people. What I didn't get time to talk about um, is that we spent a lot, we've invested a lot of time trying to determine the structure of the ion channel uh, and in particular the structure of the peptide bound to the ion channel. So what I can tell you is we, we do have a crystal structure of the human channel. We have a cryo electron microscopy um, structure of the human ion channel, but we don't have the structure bound to the peptide yet, which is most unfortunate but we're still working hard on it. I'm going to end there and just I want to say that um, I've been very fortunate to have an incredible number of brilliant postdoctoral and PhD students and undergraduate students from Brazil. This is a party from early in the year when Anna was still <laughs> here. You can see they come from many different parts of Brazil. Unfortunately, all of them have gone back home again, but uh, we hope that we'll get many more Brazilian visitors in the near future. And uh, I'll finish there. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. Oh, thank you very much, Professor King. We have a lot of compliments here about your, your lecture and a lot of questions that we have to organize now. <laughs> I Excellent. will start. <laughs> I will start with a more philosophic, philosophic one. Uh, it's from Mariana Castro, our professor here. And uh, she asking, what are the costs involved in the production and release of these peptides for commercialization? And yeah, on average, really... on average, how long should this process from the bench to the therapeutic application take? It's a really <laughs> great question. And it's, a, it's something that I think most people forget about when they're trying to develop a drug is, is how is it going to be manufactured? And can it be manufactured, one, in enough quantity? Because we're talking about a drug here that might be used in stroke heart attack, heart transplant. So we're talking about millions and millions of patients across the world. So can you make it in the quantity you need and can you make it cheap enough? And they're really important questions. And I would say in terms of commercialization, and at the moment, that's our biggest issue is how we can make this in enough yield. So we make it at the moment in E. coli, but we're also trying expression in mammalian cells. We're trying chemical synthesis. We're trying mm -hmm. algae. I, I understand uh, that. I work with yeah. antibodies. I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you know, yeah. So <laughs> the, the, the other, inter interestingly, um, you know, the other thing we're trying is conjugation to antibodies to increase the half life. Yeah, um, immunotoxin uh, is a is a is a is a good uh, point of. Yeah, and, and that and, actually. And then, okay. and then you can take it, if you do it that way, you can take advantage of some of the expression systems that have already been developed for antibodies, like, you know, Cho cells, for example. Uh, and talking about the antibody, uh, another question is about the immunogenic of these peptides. How, how immunogenic are they? Uh, do you have any, any uh, evidence that they can form immune complex? And, yeah. and, and in that way, uh, it, it will become more uh, you know, difficult to to avoid clots uh, in the, the blood vessels. So yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, the answer is that so far for all of the peptide, so there's a couple of peptide drugs that have been developed already from venoms that are quite large. So the classic example is exenotide, which many of you all know about. It's a peptide from the Gila monster lizard, a beautiful lizard. It's an anti-diabetic drug, and uh, until recently, it was twice per day injection. So diabetic patients have been taking this drug twice a day for off, you know, as much as long as a decade in some cases. Um, there's no serious immune reaction. So you do get neutralizing antibodies, but they don't cause problems and they don't decrease the efficacy of the drug. Um, and that's true as a conotide, another peptide drug, which is used for pain as well. So one, we don't, we don't expect it would be a problem. Um, but in this case, unlike exenotide, we're talking about acute use, right? We're not talking about chronic use. We're using it twice a day for years and years and years. We're talking about one-off use, mm -hmm. possibly perfusion in the case of stroke, but it's you know it's it's going to the it's a one-off treatment. So I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Okay, it's, a, so, it's an important question to look at. Anna, can you do a, a question from our yes. list? <laughs> We have a list. <laughs> a lot of questions. Yes. So, uh, some people were asking about uh, the size of the peptide. Could 
be difficult to transpass the blood brain barrier. Yep. So do you have an idea how can we solve this or? Yeah, so that, that's why I was talking about those cyclic peptides at the end. So the, the thing is, during a stroke, the, the blood brain barrier becomes slowly compromised. So the question that is debatable is at what point does it start to become severely compromised? And the general consensus is it's, you know, a couple of hours after the stroke, it begins to become pretty severely compromised and will remain compromised for as long as a day afterwards. So we think at long time points after a stroke, the peptide may well get into the brain in sufficient quantities. Remember, we only need it to be there at a few nanomolar to be efficacious. It might be okay, but that's not going to help us with first responders. Remember, I said what would change the field is if first responders could give the drug. And uh, intravenous administration is probably not going to work for first responders. Uh, with this large peptide. And that's why we've gone for the smaller cyclic peptide memetics um, of, of the drug, which we think will be much more brain permeable. So that's what we're trying to look at at the moment. And uh, we got another question from uh, Professor Marcia Mortari. And she says that, Professor King, thanks a lot for this meeting. We are testing the effects of acidosis in the brain and degeneration in Alzheimer beta amyloid aggregates. Mm -hmm only in acid, uh, an acid environment. Do you think that there is a possibility of the involvement of the, the acid sensitive receptors in this disease? It's a good question. I, I don't know. I, um, it'd be interesting to test though. I mean, if there's these, these channels are gonna be activated anytime the pH drops below seven. And, um, and, and I should have mentioned too, and this is probably relevant to Alzheimer's, they're not just present in neurons, they're present on the glial cells as well. So most of the cells of the brain do have this channel and they are going to be activated any time the pH falls below seven. So they, they may well be involved and yeah, I'd love to, very happy to provide peptide if somebody has a good model and wants to look at that. Okay. Can you do another one, Anna? Yes, one from myself. Uh, Glenn, do you talk about uh, these channels are open before in a city environment? Do you think another ion channel modulators like calcium and sodium channels could help to improve the activity of the HE? You don't know. I mean, it's one possibility is NMDA inhibitors, right? That was the, there'd been many clinical trials of any NMDA receptor blockers, but they've all failed. But there is some interplay between ASIC1A and NMDA receptors. Um, so that might be a combination that's worth looking at. But, um, you know, calcium channel inhibitors have failed in clinical trials as well. There's, there's no good evidence that inhibitors of any other ion channels are going to be effective as neuroprotectants after stroke, at least at this stage. Uh, there is another one asking about this uh, HI1A, if, mm -hmm. if it was tested on ovaries. Uh, one of the main problems with ovarian transplantation is the hyperfusion after transplants. Have mm -hmm. you tested in ovarians? No. no, no, we haven't. No, no, I haven't tested in that. There's a whole range of ischemic disorders yeah. we haven't <laughs> tested in. We, we've done a little bit on renal ischemic reperfusion injury. So, very early days, but it, it looks like it's going to be effective there as well. Um, uh -huh. so but uh, they, you can imagine that it will work too? Yes? Yeah. Or not? It, it, look, it, it, the channel seems to be, um, it's very strange, but it seems to be solely there to respond to ischemic events where there's a drop in pH. That seems to be its role. It, I don't think it plays any role in pain, um, unlike the original. Um, huh. hypotheses. Could be, could the, be. The question, question is why, I mean, what I often get asked is why would this channel get activated and start killing off brain cells? That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? But I think what's potentially happening is that in the ischemic core, um, the neurons are so energy starved um, that the brain makes this decision that I'm going to kill off the worst affected neurons in the hope that the little amount of ATP I can I have will save mm -hmm. a much larger number of neurons as a result of doing that. So I think it's a self-sacrifice of the worst affected neurons to mm -hmm. try and save more neurons. Okay. Um, otherwise it's very hard to rationalize. Mm 
Yes. Uh, there is another question uh, from Simone Nardin. Ischemic stroke produces slowly progressive neuronal damage. Did you measure the long-term neuronal damage in neurological motor scores? No, we haven't. That's a great question. So we've only, our measurements were only made 72 hours after the stroke. So those measurements of behavioral outcomes. So we'd, we'd very much like to look at longer term outcomes. If we went to clinical trial, we'd be looking at three month outcomes. We'd be looking at three at sort of neurological scores three months down the track after the stroke. That's the, kind of the standard period. Uh -huh. but we've not got that yet. Okay. Can you Good do question. the other one, uh, Anna? Yep. Um, Professor Wagner asks, in hypervolemic shock after trauma, we observe effects of a systemic ischemia followed by reperfusion. Many patients develop lung injury. Has H1A1 been tested in such cases or animal models? Or no, lung no, it hasn't. That would be a really interesting scenario to test it in, I reckon. Yeah, no, Those channels been. are rightly expressed and different tissues or mainly in the brain? Well, many cases people haven't looked at and, and in some cases the data is confusing because they've used this, what they call an ASIC-1 antibody and that antibody doesn't distinguish between ASIC-1A and ASIC-1B. And these splice isoforms do completely different things. And, and again, with a lot of the transcript stuff, right? It's, it's just looking at ASIC-1 transcripts which don't discriminate between ASIC-1A and 1B. And so I think a lot of the data out there is very confusing. The only place it's very being, it's very clear is in the brain where ASIC-1A is definitely the dominant subtype and, and our stuff in the heart. But in other organs, I, th I think it's not clear is the, is the bottom line. There's still no antibody that recognizes just ASIC-1A. It doesn't exist, which is a uh -huh. real problem for this field. What, which, what, we, what we think these molecules might be actually useful for and what we're doing right now is fluorescently labeling them and using those to actually look at distribution of the channel because they're very, very selective. And there are some questions about the complexity of those peptides um, mm. and how big are they and uh, how stable are they too? Because you, you mm. told about a half life of uh, 20 hours, what was that? 20, 20 hours? minutes, 20 minutes. 20 sure. minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, mm. uh, uh, how you deal with this? Uh, uh, thinking about uh, a medicine or a treatment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So they're very stable in the sense that they're resistant to proteases. So if you, if, you, if you sort of took some serum from the blood bank and you put this peptide in that serum, it would last for days. It's super stable. But when you put it into the circulation, it has a short half-life, which I think means it's been cleared by the kidney relatively quickly, which is what you expect for most small peptides. They don't last very long. Now, it's the half-life of 20, 25 minutes in a mouse would correspond to slightly longer in a human, and that's much longer than TPA. TPA only has a half-life of five to 10 minutes. So how do they deal with that? Uh, the way they deal with that is they perfuse it. So it's not a bolus dose, they just perfuse it over a period of time. And we may have to do the same. So in the context of heart attack and stroke, we may have to use perfusion. Um, you know, the surgeons, the, the physicians would prefer a bolus dose, but <laughs> the current drug they have is, perfu is a perfusion drug. <laughs> yes. so it yes. would just be the same. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And do you think to substitute uh, uh, these peptides by, uh, by chemicals, like uh, you design the drug, uh, which is not a biomolecule at all? Is that is that make sense? Uh, it's just occurred to me now. <laughs> what was that? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Yeah, uh, if you can substitute these peptides for chemical chemical you compounds, small, small molecules. Yeah, small molecules. Yes. Yeah. The problem is that no small molecules that anybody's found have anywhere near the potency, or really importantly, the selectivity. Right. So that ameliorate. Number one, it's it's 20,000 fold less potent, but it also inhibits all of the ASIC channels, not just ASIC-1A, it's got no selectivity at all. And that's the problem. These, these peptides are just incredibly, not just potent, but incredibly selective as well. Mm -hmm. So the small molecule drugs, of course, would have even shorter half-lives as well, most likely. So that's mm -hmm. not gonna solve that problem and maybe make it even more difficult for stroke. Um, mm -hmm. They've got really short half-lives. So I, I, I don't think, um, it necessarily solves any of the problems by going to small molecules. I think I think the small cyclic peptides might be in the sweet spot. They still have the potency and the selectivity, but they're small enough that they might be reasonably permeable to the brain. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So, and how about yeah. uh, uh, modifications like pegylation? Uh, yeah, have yeah, you think? Definitely. Have you thought about that? Uh, yes. yes, yes, that's a, that's a good idea. So, there is one drug. Uh, so, at the moment, there are no drugs that will uh, protect the brain after a stroke. But there is one molecule that just went f- through a phase three clinical trial, and for a certain cohort of stroke patients, showed some efficacy, which was very exciting. Um, that drug is a peptide. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a short peptide. I think it's eight or nine residues, but it's still um, injected intravenously and it has to get into the brain. What they did was added a TAT molecule to it. So you, many of you know about TAT and penetratin. There are small peptides that are really good at getting across cell membranes. So what they did is simply hooked up their peptide drug to the TAT peptide and used that as the mechanism for getting across the blood-brain barrier. It certainly works, but if you image... A patient that's been or an animal that's been given that drug it's everywhere tat just takes it everywhere it's not selective in any way for the brain so that the the peptide ends up all over the place so that's the downside of using that approach but there are other approaches such as pegylation or there are certain tags you could add that are supposed to specifically enhance permeability across the blood brain barrier and yeah, we've got a student who actually started last week and that's what his thesis is all about. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna, do you have any other questions? Uh, I think we uh, passed through. Okay, do it. Uh, just one more. Uh, uh, yes. I imagine that you have been looking for similar sequences in different venoms and different spiders. Uh, do you think this is, could be some similar peptides in other venoms or similar domains or is it a totally unique thing? Yeah, it's really weird and no, we don't find it anywhere else. So, so there's only this drug and then there's the related molecule of half the size PCTX1, which I mentioned, which is found in, a, in a, um, uh, an African tarantula and, and that's unrelated to the spider that we found. It's the only two spiders of you know, 50,000 spiders that we have described so far that we've seen this in. So we don't think it's widespread, at least we don't see it. I mean, it may be that it's just expressed at a really low level that we, people haven't found it. And maybe as we start looking deeper and deeper in the venoms, we will find small quantities of related peptides in other venoms. But yeah, so far we haven't seen it anywhere else at all. So it was just very lucky, as I said, very lucky. And I think it just, you know, the point I wanted to make for the students that might be watching is that, um, you know, be aware of what's happening around you. Don't just be so focused on your own project that you uh, don't don't know what's happening around you. Sandy was aware of a project that wasn't her own project and was smart enough to notice that peptide and bring it to my attention. And if she hadn't have done that, we would never have discovered that peptide and we would never have been able to do all of these, you know, fantastic experiments. Beautiful work. Congratulations, Glenn. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk early in the morning for us. (laughs) And it was very nice to, you know, exercise the brain. (laughs) Yes, yes. Very early in the morning. have your cups of coffee ready. (laughs) Yes, yes. So thank you very much, Dr. King. Uh, Pleasure. We are very grateful for you, for your lecture. And it was nice to wake up with this nice lecture today. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Thank you much. for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So, Zimago. Right.